Ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah. Ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah. Hayya Alhamdulillah in Ahmaduhu, when a stain who won a stag firu. When I would be lahi and Shururi and Fusina, women say Yati Amalina, Man Yahdihilahu Fala Mudilla, woman Yudlit Fala Hadiala, was Shadwala Ilaha Ilahu, Wahdahu, La Sharikala, was Shadwana Muhammad and Abduhu or Rasulu. Ya, you Haladina Amanu Tahullah Hakka to Kartihi, Walla Tamutuna Illa, were unto Muslimun. يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار وبعد إمام بخاري رحمه الله recorded a hadith in which Anas رضي الله عنه said that once the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم uh, while he was leaning against the wall in his masjid in Medina, he dozed off for a little bit. And then he woke up with a smile. So Anas radiallahu anhu and the other sahaba that were there, they asked him, why are you smiling? And he sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that Allah has revealed a surah to me just now in his dream. And we know that the inspirations used to come to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam sometimes while he was awake and sometimes in his sleep. And in this specific occasion, the surah that was revealed to him, he recited that Allah just sent to me, Inna a'atainaka al-kawthar, fasalli li rabbika wanhar, inna shani akahu al-abtar. So this is the ayah, this is the surah, the smallest surah in the Qur'an, just three verses. That indeed we have given you al-kawthar, therefore pray and make sacrifice for your Lord, and those who insult you, or attack you, or whatever it may be the case, they are the ones who will be al abtar and we will explain this in the end, insha'Allah. So this surah, the shortest surah in the Qur'an, it's a special gift to the Prophet wasallam. And he asked Anas and the companions that were there, that, أَتَدْرُونَ مَا الْكَوْثَرِ Do you know what this al kawthar that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying? That inna a'afayna al kawthar. Indeed, we have granted you al kawthar. So, as was the case with the Sahaba, they said, "Allahu wa Rasuluhu a'lam." Allah and His Messenger know best. And this is a side point from this 
and many other instances that happen with the Prophet wasallam asking a question to the Sahaba. There's two benefits here. One, of course, from the Sunnah, that whenever a teacher is teaching, part of the teaching methodology is to ask questions, to make sure that the listener is actually paying attention. And also from the Sunnah of the Sahaba, that if you don't know something, don't try to be a big shot and answer things that are wrong. Just say, Allahu A'lam. To, the, to this day, when we see the ulama issuing fatawa, at the very end, you see that they sign off by saying, Wallahu A'lam. And Allah knows best. Even though they're probably giving 100% dalil, everything is very clear, but still they sign off by saying, Wallahu A'lam. Following that sunnah of the sahaba. Because at the end of the day, Allah is the only one that does know the best. But what happens to us lay people, and especially day, this day and age with social media and all this stuff, it's like everybody's a sheikh. Somebody has, has a question, maybe he has a question for the imam of the masjid. We're going to hear, it's okay, I, I know the answer, just ask me. You don't, you don't got to go to him. We try to be the imam. We try to be the sheikh. But this was not the way the sahaba were. Even if they knew an answer, out of adab for the teacher, which is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allahu wa rasuluhu wa alam. Al-Kawthar exists in the, in, in, the, in the Arabic language linguistically. They knew the linguistic meaning. But this specific meaning here, in this ayah, of course they didn't know because they have to wait for the Prophet sallallahu to teach them. That what is this? So Allahu wa rasuluhu wa alam. Al-Kawthar, linguistically, it refers to everything that is khayr. Every goodness that you can think of is Al-Kawthar. And in that goodness is a specific khayr that is only for uh, the Prophet wasallam, which is the nahr, the river in Jannah called Al-Kawthar. Alright? And this hadith is narrated also in another uh, narration in Bukhari, when the Prophet wasallam went on his night journey, and he was walking through Jannah with Jibreel. And he came, through, came across the river and he asked, مَا هَذَا يَا Jibreel?" <laughs> he asked him, what is this? And Jibreel alayhi salam told him, this is the kawthar that Allah has promised you. So this is the river that flows out of Jannah. And on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, this river will flow out to form the hawd of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we'll get to that in a few minutes. So Al-Kawthar in Arabic refers to everything that is khair that we can think of in this dunya and akhirah and specifically the khair of the river in Jannah Al-Kawthar. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here promised the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that inna a'tainak al-kawthar. For you we have granted you every goodness that you can think of. And you think about it who is the best from Bani Adam? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah took two Prophets as a Khalil, as his intimate friend, the Prophet ﷺ and Ibrahim ﷺ. And from those two, one of them was given Al-Maqam Al-Mahmud, the most praiseworthy, highest state, which is from Muhammad mm-hmm. ﷺ. So Allah kept Al-Kawthar for him. Tremendous abundance, the general and the specific, is only for the Prophet ﷺ. And as we shall see in a, in a few minutes, that the believers who follow his sunnah will also reap the benefits of that kawthar. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in other ahadith collected in Sahih Muslim, he described uh, this kawthar, this river. He said that masiratu shahr, that if you were to uh, cross this river, how big it is, it will take you a month journey. Non-stop if you were to travel. Keep traveling non-stop for a month, that's how... It would, uh, that's how long it would take you to cross the two sides, from one side to the other side. Mm-hmm. The water is whiter than milk. And even sweeter than honey. Whiter than milk, sweeter than honey. And the one who drinks from this will never ever get thirsty again. And the kizanuhu kanujum is sama. The cups that are around this river are like the stars in the sky. 
Can any one of us go outside and count the number of stars? We can't. Trillions and trillions of stars. We don't know exactly how many. So just like that, the cups that are around al kawthar are that many. Just like the stars in the sky. That's a gift for the mu'minun, for the believers who will follow Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this life. They will be able to drink from this water. Something that we can't even imagine. What do we know that's whiter than milk? That color doesn't exist in our mind because we've never seen it. What is there that you can taste that's sweeter than honey? We don't know because we've never tasted it. What drink can you think of that if you drink just one cup, you'll never feel thirsty again? We don't know. These are rewards in the akhirah that's there for the mu'minun. But it's from Allah's rahmah that He gave us these descriptions so we have things to look forward to. As Imam Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he said that even if our Rabb didn't tell us about the rewards that we would get, we're still obligated to worship Him because of the fact He is al-Khaliq, the Creator. But because He is a rahman al-Rahim, from His mercy, He gave us vivid descriptions of what awaits us if we are able to fulfill La ilaha illallah. And He also gave us descriptions of what happens to those who fall into shirk and die from the mushrikun, as the mushrikun. He gave us descriptions of Jahannam as well. So it's from Allah's mercy that He did this. Think about it, those of us who are parents. To make our children listen, you're constantly rewarding them. Okay, if you do good, we're going to buy you this game, we'll give you this candy, we're going to buy you, you know, give you new shoes and this and that. You're constantly rewarding your children, otherwise they don't listen to you. That's how Bani Adam are. If Allah told us, worship me, we are still obligated, but it's from His Rahmah that He gave us these descriptions. That if we are able to fulfill it, subhanAllah, all this awaits us. So let it be a motivation for you. All these descriptions, this kawthar, this river. The shortest surah in the Qur'an, just this first ayah, look at the amount of bounties and good news there is in it for the believers. So, the Prophet Sallallahu described this. And on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, which we come to the next point of Al-Kawthar, this river from Jannah will flow out to Ardul Ma'shar, the place where the people will be gathering for the Hisab, for the reckoning. And once all the Kuffar and everybody is taken care of, there will be the Hawd and as the Jamhur Al-Ulama, the majority of the scholars, they said that the Hawd of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's like... Uh, Meaning what it is, it's like a pond, it's like water, just a, forms like a tank of water. The river flows out from Jannah and it forms a tank at, uh, on Yom al Qiyamah. So this comes before the Sirat, which is the bridge that people have to cross and make it into Jannah. That's the last thing that happens. Mm -hmm. So right before the Sirat, as the majority of the scholars said, is the Hawd of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So this is the same, that water, the same, so white, so sweet, you drink, you'll never be thirsty. And the angels are there, as well as the Prophet Wasallam in another narration in Bukhari, he said that I will be the one preceding all of Bani Adam. He'll be waiting there. He'll be waiting there, think about it. The Prophet Wasallam waiting next to his hawd, filling the cups of water and waiting for his followers so he can personally give them this drink. What an honor. You would think it'd be the opposite. We want to serve Rasulullah Wasallam, But this is the gift for those who follow his sunnah properly. He himself Wasallam, will wait and fill up the cups and pass it on to the believers to drink. So he'll be the first one. He'll be waiting. And then the believers will come. He will recognize them. As Sahal ibn Sa'ad radiallahu anhu narrated in another hadith, that he will know them. Ya'rifuhum wa ya'rifuni. He will recognize them and they will recognize me. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will recognize them. How? They'll have the signs of sujood on their foreheads. The signs of salah on the rest of their bodies, they will look like Muslims. And they will recognize Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he'll recognize them and they will recognize him. But at that moment, 
Some angels will come and prevent those people from drinking from the hawd of Rasulullah. The angels will come and forcefully take those people away. And then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam will cry, "Ay Rabbi ashabi, O Lord, these are my companions." And in another narration, "Ummati, this is my nation." And in another na- and another narration, that "Innahum minni, they are from me." Look at these three different riwayas to give you more emphasis of how much the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam will be pleading with Allah. What's going on? They look like Muslims. I recognize them, they recognize me. Yet the angels of Adab are pulling them away by force. And he pleads to Allah, they are from me, they are my nation, they are my companions. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reply, reply to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that you don't know how much they changed after you. In one narration it says, Baddala meaning to change, and Ahdathu in another narration, how much they introduced. How much bid'ah they introduced into the religion, or how much they changed the religion after you. So then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say, Sufkan, Sufkan liman baddala ba'di. Far removed, far removed for those who changed after me. They're following a deen that I did not leave behind. Or they are practicing the deen in a certain way that I did not explain. So this, my dear brothers and sisters, there's tremendous khair, a big good news for us in this surah. But at the same time, there is a severe warning. If you want to drink from the hawd of Rasulullah on Yawm al and imagine in other narrations in, in, in the Musnad of Ahmed, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told us, that on Yawm al Qiyamah the sun will be a hand span above our heads. And there are so many ayat in the Quran. Like, for example, when in Surah Hajj, when the Zalzala, this final earthquake happens, a woman who's breastfeeding her infant is going to drop the kid and not care about it. Can you imagine? A mother who's breastfeeding her child will literally drop the baby and only care about herself. No one will have time for anybody else. And in that situation, there is an opportunity for the believers to drink. Where it's going to be so hot, barefoot, naked, uncircumcised people being taken account of. And here is an opportunity for those, as long as they fulfilled the condition of following the sunnah, they'll be given a drink. What a rahmah in that state. This is not jannah yet. It's on Yawm al The Kawthar River is inside. The Hawd is on the ground where the reckoning is taking place. So in that situation, Allah gives us respite, insha'Allah. But the condition is that you have to follow His Sunnah. You look at what's going on, subhanAllah, in, this, in these times. We have Imams and Shuyukh. They promote and they say, Marriage between homosexuals is okay. We see imams coming out and supporting, uh, you know, where a woman is going to give the khutbah and lead the prayers and this and that. Oh, it's okay, you know, uh, there's ikhtilaf, everything is ikhtilaf. Anything you can think of, there's ikhtilaf. That's their excuse. Or you look at so many other things that are happening in Muslim countries, millions of people. If they need something, they get sick, their kids are sick, whatever it happens, they go to the grave of Fulan and they'll make a sajda in front of the grave and they're calling, Wali Fulan, you know, give me help and give me this. What about Allah? Which is the worst sin, shirk. So look at what's going on in the ummah. How much we have changed in our dealings with Allah, in our dealings with each other. Look at all the chaos in the Muslim lands. Muslims killing each other. Killer doesn't know why he's killing, the killed doesn't know why he's being killed. This is our state. How much we have changed after the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this is a stern warning and of course a glad tidings. You want to drink from the hawd of Rasulullah? You want to see Al-Kawthar? Then we have to follow his sunnah. We have to stick to it. And this is a sign that you love Allah. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the ayah, 
that if you truly love Allah, then follow me. This is a sign that you love Allah, is that you follow His sunnah. In everything that you do, how you're praying, how you're fasting, how you're giving your zakat, how you're dealing with one another, how do you f- solve community problems, social problems? Is it stemming from the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or not? Or when you're faced with problems in your family, what did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do? And people had problems. People had marital problems even during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Even in his own house. Look at when Ali radiallahu anhu, because argument between him and Fatima radiallahu anha got so intense, he was sleeping in the masjid. He couldn't go home. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came and saw him. And even made a funny statement, Abu Turab, because he was covered with dust sleeping in the masjid. What's going on? Then he complained about his daughter. So these type of things even happen with the best of human beings. But how were they solved? That's what we have to do. Every problem in our life, whether with our spouses or children or in our communities, whatever it may be. And of course, the number one problem, we have to work hard to eradicate shirk. How can we raise the banner of La ilaha illallah in our lands and also spread the message of La ilaha illallah in these lands? That's the number one mission of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That he came to resurrect the message of all the anbiya before him, of Tawheed. So it all boils down to how much of the sunnah are we willing to follow. Who wants to be in that position that you're going towards this reward? You see the Prophet ﷺ waiting there, sitting with the cup of water. And you're running to him and then all of a sudden the angel grabs you and throws you into the fire. Nobody wants to be in that state. So brothers and sisters, we have to strive hard to learn our religion and to make sure that we implement the sunnah in our daily lives and especially in all the acts of ibadah that we do. How we worship Allah has to be according to the sunnah. How we live life has to be according to the sunnah. And unfortunately in many parts, in many uh, Muslim nations, because people are unaware of the language, like even in, uh, let's say you know, in the indo pak subcontinent, where my fam- family is from. Even I grew up, sunnah means optional. That's the fiqhi meaning, like something is a sunnah meaning, it's an optional act of worship. Like you have uh, fard salah, and then you have the sunnah rawatib, the sunnah salah, uh, the uh, raka'at attached to it. So it's optional. So they think the word sunnah automatically only means optional. Oh, it's just a sunnah, you don't have to do it. But the word sunnah is much deeper. It's the path, it's the way, it's the... Explanation, it's the practices of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have no choice but to follow the Sunnah. We have to follow his way. We have to follow his interpretations. Look at the chaos that's happening because somebody takes this ayah, thinks he can go randomly blow things up. Is this how Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam explained this verse? Is this how he implemented this verse? No. That's how we know that someone is wrong or someone is right. The Qur'an is our guide and the key to understand the Qur'an is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His sunnah. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah, salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. So then the next two verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَصَلِّ لِرَبِّكَ وَنْحَرْ So sacrifice, uh, so pray and then make sacrifices for your Lord. As Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu said that this has two meanings, of course. One is the literal meaning referring to uh, the Eid al-Adha, you pray first and then you make your sacrifice. And then of course the other meaning that's contained in this, that whenever you're praying or making any types of sacrifices, it has to be for your Lord alone. Meaning the message of Tawheed. فَصَلِّي لِرَبِّكَ وَنْحَرْ It's only for your Lord. Any act of ibadah that you do, it has to be for the sake of Allah and Allah alone. It's not to look good in front of your family or in front of your community. That's why you're showing up for Jum'ah because people are going to talk about you or you're praying on time because people are going to talk about you or whatever may be the case. 
you only do the acts of worship to earn the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You do it out of His love. You do it out of fear of His punishment and you do it out of hope in His mercy. That's why you do all the acts of worship. And then the last verse, إِنَّ شَانِ أَكَهُوَ abtar. It was the way of Jahiliyyah that whoever used to have daughters, they would label him as abtar, meaning cut off. And we know that the Prophet ﷺ, his daughters grew up, got married, but his sons, Ibrahim and Qasim, they died when they were infants. So the Quraysh used to mock him that he's al abtar he's cut off, his lineage has been cut off. Because this was the tradition from Jahiliyyah, that the son would grow up and carry on the legacy of the father. Alright? So because he had no grown sons, the Quraysh, the pagans would make fun of him, that he is al abtar So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala re- replies that, inna shani akahu al abtar They're calling you abtar but these are the people, these mushrikun are the ones who are abtar They will be cut off, cut off from what? From the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at all those people that used to make fun of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam just because he didn't have grown sons. Every word of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his actions, to the point that how he used to even use the hammam is recorded. There is not a single human being in the history of mankind that whose life has been recorded in such details like Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is the praised one. His legacy will last on, in this world until Yawm Al-Qiyamah. So where are those people that used to call him Abtar? They're gone. Abu Jahal, Abu Lahab, where are they? We know Allah told us. They're going to be in eternal fire. So they used to... Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali and all these other companions, radiallahu anhum ajma'een, how did they react? They didn't go around acting like hooligans when the Prophet ﷺ was attacked. Look at Khalid ibn Walid. He came and broke the tooth of the Prophet ﷺ in the battle of Uhud. But then Allah guided him to be from the best Muslims ever. So it depended on the reactions, their patience, and even the worst of people, Abu Sufyan and Khalid ibn Walid, they took years, but then they became the best of Muslims. How do we react today? Allah already promised that those who mock the Prophet, they are the ones who are abtar. He already told us this in the Qur'an, in this ayah. So we should have more patience in how we react in the name of defending our Prophet. And that's it's a contradiction. We say that we are rising up to defend our Prophet, but then the things we do is absolutely contradictory to what the Prophet ﷺ said or did. It doesn't make any sense. It's a deception from shaitan. You want to defend and honor your prophet? Do what he did. Do what his companions did. React in the way he and his companions did. With sabr, with patience, with intelligence. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that when you argue, وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِهِ ahsan. Allah didn't tell us don't argue, be chicken, cowards, run away, run the other direction. Because a lot of apologists do that. Oh, I'm very sorry for my religion, you know. No, we're not supposed to be apologetic for our deen. Allah didn't say back down from an argument. He said argue, but argue in a way that is better. If a dog bites you, you're not going to bite the dog back. There will be no difference between you and the dog. But you are going to do something to the dog. Maybe smack it or hit it with a stick or do something. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly tells us, argue. Argue back. Defend your religion. Defend your prophet but argue in a way that is better. Don't stoop to their level. They push your buttons, you want to react, but do it in according to Islam. That will give people more, you know, they'll be in awe of your religion. They'll be in awe of your character. And it will get them more curious to learn about your religion. The worst of people can become the best of Muslims. We see it with the Sahaba. Or you look at the that... Um, that minister, member of parliament in, in, in Sweden. A few years ago, he wanted to ban the adhan, ban uh, any masjid from giving the adhan. No masjid can have a, a, a minaret or something like that. But then what happened? He, he took a shahada and made hajj. I think it was last year or the year before. A guy who was against Islam in, in, in politically so 
you know, publicly, Allah guided his heart to the point that he even made Hajj right away. Alhamdulillah. So we don't know where Allah or when Allah will guide somebody's heart. But we have to stay within the Sunnah and we have to remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the protection of his religion and his prophet upon himself. Even if we did nothing, Allah will still protect his religion. So we shouldn't overdo things in a wrong way. Just follow the path. Do your job, what you're supposed to do. And leave the rest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at those people that used to say, uh, it was a huge trend a few years back. People used to come, I'm a former uh, Muslim, and this and that. There was a guy, his name was uh, Walid Shabbat. He said, I'm a former Palestinian terrorist, and now I'm Christian, I found Jesus. And <laughs> are you somebody who's a former terrorist? And you get the, it was all fake. They were, he was a Palestinian Christian. He was never Muslim to begin with. Or there was another, uh, there was another Egyptian woman. She was a Coptic. She was never Muslim. Her entire families are Coptics. Nobody's Muslim. So they would bring these Arab Christians and make them pretend that oh they came from Muslim families. They're now they found Jesus in this country. So they're Christians and they're bad mouthing Islam left and right. Subhanallah. Uh, that uh, this, uh, the guy from CNN, Anderson Cooper, they did like an uh, investigation and everything. All of them got arrested for t uh, tax evasion and fraud. Allah took care of them. You see? They came pretending to mock the Prophet of Islam, dishonoring him. They called him a child molester, this, that, what all these things. But then Allah is the one who exposed their hidden secrets. And now they're in prison. The same kuffar who used to praise them are the ones who imprisoned them. Subhanallah. So this will happen. Allah will take care of the honor of His Prophet. And these three verses is a tremendous goodness, a warning, a glad tiding, and a message of patience to all of us. The shortest surah in the Quran, but look at the message that's found in it. And as to follow the sunnah as a reminder, let this be a motivation that subhanallah brothers and sisters there is so much hikmah and ilm that's contained in the kalam of Allah. And we can talk about this for hours and hours. This is just a Jummah khutbah we summarized. This is just three ayat from the Quran. Tawheed, Sunnah, Fiqh, everything is contained in it. So imagine if you took the time to go into the kalam of Allah and give it time like you're supposed to, how much more it would benefit our lives and how much more we'd actually understand our religion. And you look at many parts of the Muslim Ummah where our mother tongue is not Arabic, we have devised a system. System. Millions of Muslims are memorizing the Quran like parrots. They don't even know what is Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Where did this come from? After colonization, forget the language, forget this, you'll, because once you take away the language, who's going to understand the deen? Look at millions of kids. MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, they're memorized the Quran. But as they grow, we need them to understand what they memorized. On the face of this earth, in the history of mankind, you will never find a group of human beings who only focus on memorizing a book without understanding a single letter. We're the first people to do that. Find any other nation in the history of man. Nobody did that. How do you read a book and not want to know what you're reading? But this is how shaitan has deceived us. Millions of children memorize the Quran on a daily basis, but they can't even they don't even know the translation of the first ayah. So it falls back on our shoulders, the elders of the community, the parents, the grandparents, that what did we do? We have to devise a system to reformat our children, let them understand the kalam of Allah, let them understand the sunnah of his messenger. So understanding the language is very, very important. That's what's gonna teach us our religion. <coughs> So with this reminder, brothers and sisters, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase us in knowledge, Amen. to give us more patience, Amen. and to give us the proper understanding of the sunnah, and may he protect us from all the falsehood that is spreading on a daily basis. Amen.